very much. It's a privilege to be here. I would like to thank uh, Professor Carl Leo and the Hector Fellow Academy for the kind invitation. Um, we'll talk about bioelectronics, which is uh, an emerging field that aims to establish an interface between nature's most advanced creation, which is living uh, organisms, and humankind's most advanced engineering venture, which is microelectronics. And this is a problem in making um, bridges along properties that are very different. For example, in terms of mechanical properties, biological systems are mostly soft, while electronic systems as we know them today are rather stiff. Signaling the communication between components in biology, whether these are cells or tissues or organs, is rather complex and in some cases not well understood while the communication between these two devices here takes place by exchanging an electron flux. Biological systems are dynamic, they change as a function of time, while electronics, they spend their life in the form they're fabricated in. So it's important to establish communication between these two worlds across these properties, uh, mismatches in two senses. In from biology to electronics in order to do diagnosis and in the opposite direction in order to deliver uh, treatments. There has been a lot of progress over the, the past decade in bridging the mechanical properties discontinuity. And we now have electronics that are, rather than being hard and stiff, they can be soft and elastic and conformable, and we can make good mechanical properties, uh, mechanical contacts with tissues. Currently, there is a lot of research being focused on bridging the communications mismatch, and I think organic electronics have a lot to offer in this arena. So I will tell you about this today. More pertinent to interfacing with the brain, um, let me start by saying that Understanding how the brain works ranks, in my view, very high as an intellectual challenge for humankind. Akin to understanding our place in the cosmos, what else is out there. Um, it is very beautiful thought to, uh, to think that from an assembly of cells arise our thoughts, our dreams, our aspirations, who we are. In addition to the fundamental endeavor, there is a practical aspect in understanding the brain, and that is to be able to help people with uh, uh, diseases that rewire the brain. And the cost of such disease in the US is $800 billion a year. Um, so it's, it's something that also makes a lot of sense economically. To the zeroth approach, the brain consists of uh, neurons that are connected with each other through extensions that are called the dendrite, receive information, compile it, and then the outcome of this computation is an action potential, which is like a voltage pulse that goes down a wire, which is called the axon, and then either inhibits or excites the postsynaptic neuron. This is associated with a flux of ions in and out of the cell membrane. And this creates an electrical disturbance in the electrolyte that surrounds the neurons that can be picked up by an electrode. If we put an electrode in the proximity, it will be able to pick a tiny little uh, 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 modulation, and we will know that this neuron has fired. So in the clinic, this is done in three configurations. Electroencephalography involves scalp electrodes, electrodes that are placed directly on the skin. And they can pick up the activity of ensembles, of networks of many, many neurons in the underlying tissue. The spatial resolution here is very poor. We can read activity in brain areas of the order of a centimeter uh, in, uh, in length which is very coarse. At the other extreme, we have stereotaxic electroencephalography, where we penetrate the brain with electrodes that can be microfabricated, and they can distinguish the activity of a single neuron. So this is the ultimate in spatial resolution, but of course, it's a very invasive technique. 
Between the two lies electrocorticography, where we do a craniotomy, expose the surface of the brain, and then place an array of electrodes on the surface of the brain, but without penetrating the brain. This is considered as a technique which lies in between the two in terms of being not as invasive as electroencephalography and providing uh, a stereotaxis and providing a bit better resolution than electroencephalography. But the ultimate resolution here is not really, uh, wasn't really understood up to a few years ago. These are used, these tools are used in the clinic for diagnosis purposes. For example, in the case of uh, severe drug-resistant epilepsy, uh, patients will get implanted with electrode arrays in their brain. And these electrode arrays will be placed in different parts of the brain and will measure brain activity until a seizure manifests itself. And the purpose of this exercise is to localize which part of the brain causes this seizure so that the neurosurgeon can decide whether this part of the brain can be safely removed and stop the seizures. They're also being used to deliver treatment, such as in the case of Parkinson's disease. Here there are electrodes that are implanted deep in the brain and provide constant electrical stimulation. And the tremor and shuffling gait that are associated with Parkinson's disease can be instantly removed when the stimulator is switched on. The field of bioelectronics goes all the way back to the work of Galvani in the 18th century, the famous experiment where you apply a potential and you make the frog's legs uh, twitch. And about 200 years later, there were pacemakers uh, in humans. At that uh, time, the state of technology was such that electronics and batteries were external. In 1958, there was the first implantation of a fully implanted uh, device. This is the patient who received it. He ended up undergoing 26 surgeries to replace corroded leads and batteries, but lived to the age of 86 and survived his first doctor. Today, these devices yeah, are, um, are very small, and they can be placed inside the heart using a rather simple uh, procedure. And there are many more devices, stimulators, that are uh, approved by the FDA in the, uh, in the United States. Um, pacemakers are currently uh, rather a routine device with 600,000 implantations per year. Cochlear implants for restoring uh, hearing, uh, about 300,000 patients cumulatively up to 2010 and many more and several more are in the process of being approved. So this is a field that is taking off um, so much that is uh, attracting the interest of very large companies, including Google, who announced about a year ago uh, an alliance with a pharmaceutical company to develop stimulators in order to replace, in certain cases, treatment with drugs. Now, this all is in the commercial sphere. Um, in research, there has been tremendous interest over the past decade to establish good mechanical contact. This is an example from John Rogers uh, at that time at Illinois, currently Northwestern, who used ultra-flexible um, uh, plastic foils to make electronics that can conform very nicely to the curvilinear uh, structure of tissues. Here, the context, this is electrocorticography. It's electrodes placed on the surface of the brain. And if you notice, the electrodes are fairly large. They're millimeter size, um, probing a fairly coarse uh, part of the, the brain. The reason for that is that signals, neuronal signals that propagate at the surface of the brain are very weak. So you need to average over a large area in order to get a meaningful, um, uh, a meaningful signal. And this is a, a, a situation where organic electronics can help. The reason why um, 
is because we can increase the coupling between the worlds of biology and the worlds of electronics. If you use a traditional electronic material, such as silicon, you would have a barrier uh, layer, such as an oxide or a nitride, separating the electronic charges in the semiconductor from the ions in the electrolyte, in the biological media. And this weakens their interaction. Even in the case where you would have, uh, for example, a metal film that has no oxide, no barrier, you would end up having a, forming a capacitor in two dimensions over the surface where you would have ions on one side of the interface and electronic charge at the other. And their coupling in this situation is as big as it can get for a two-dimensional architecture, and it's characterized by a capacitance per unit area that is of the order of 1 to 10 microfarad per uh, square centimeter. And this is a hard limit. You cannot go beyond that. Unless you use a material such as uh, P.PSS, the material Professor Leo uh, talked about, that allows ions to enter in its volume. So in this case, you can have a three-dimensional coupling between ionic and electronic carriers that can dramatically increase the communication between the worlds of biology and electronics. This is manifested in the lab in a capacitance that depends not on the area of your electrode, but rather on the whole volume of the electrode. So the thickness here plays a big role. If you take, for example, an electrode that is very thin, it's 130 nanometers thick, it will give you a capacitance which is 100 times larger than what you would have from a flat metal film of the same area. So you can increase the coupling between biology and electronics by two orders of magnitude here, which means that you can make electrodes two orders of magnitude smaller and still be able to record the very weak neural signatures. So you gain in spatial resolution. And this is shown here. We were able to fabricate electrodes uh, uh, that are small, that are of the order of the size, of the order of magnitude of the size of a single neuron. These were fabricated on very thin plastic foils that are conformable to the brain. And then when used in the brain of rats, we saw the signatures of single neuron activity, something that was thought to not be possible from the surface of the brain. So without penetrating the brain, we can read single neurons. And this got the neuroscience community very excited because it allows a non-invasive, high-resolution uh, spatial mapping of the brain. This technology was translated to the clinic um, it first happened in 2014-2015, uh, in uh, um, and it's used in the brain of uh, epileptic patients to do high-resolution spatial uh, mapping. And again, there were signatures there of single neuron activity. Today, this technology is used in several clinics in the U.S., and um, there are two clinics in France that are preparing to, uh, to use this technology. And there are already a couple of papers that are coming out showing the advantages of this technology. And the uh, wonderful thing is that there are two young professors in the U.S. pushing this technology very far, one in uh, New York, another one in California. So, Let's switch now gears to treatment. Uh, can we use organic electronics to deliver uh, treatment? In the context of epilepsy, um, the first line of uh, treatment is anti-epileptic drugs that are taken in a systemic fashion, and they go all over uh, the body. But about 30% of patients remain drug-resistant for reasons that we do not understand. In addition to the drug resistance, there are also side effects associated with the systemic delivery, that the fact that the drug goes all over the, uh, the organism. In case where there is drug resistance and epilepsy is severe enough to, to be disabling, resective surgery, removing part of the brain that gives rise to uh, the seizures, can be an option. However, this is not always possible, as sometimes the, uh, the focus 
of the seizure, the epileptogenic zone, overlaps with an area of high function, uh, for example, the eloquent cortex. In these cases, we propose that an implantable device that can provide localized drug delivery where and when is needed might represent a viable option. Delivery of drug in the brain is something that is being developed um, in the context of brain tumors, where the tumor is removed. There are some cells that are left um, uh, in there. And there are devices that are being implanted that can ooze out a small amount of drug, hopefully killing the remaining cells, or using a catheter that pushes drug into the brain in this area. Now, there are several reasons that I will not um, go into that these strategies are not appropriate for, uh, for chronic use in epilepsy. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, a group in Sweden at the uh, a collaboration between Linköping University and Karolinska Institute developed a new type of device for drug delivery that uses electrophoresis. This means that it can take a drug molecule, a drug ion, and drag it through a solid layer and deliver it from one reservoir to a target reservoir. The advantage of this device compared to catheter systems is that it delivers only the drug and not the solvent, which means you can deliver a lot of drug, but also you don't change the pressure at the delivery point, which is very important in the context of the brain. Um, so, working with the Swedes, we tested this uh, device in an in vitro model of epilepsy. We took a brain slice and we got it to seize, to become hyperactive, and then delivered drug and wanted to see if that will stop the uh, hyperactivity. Uh, so, this is the experiment. We're delivering drug in this location and we're measuring the activity of the brain near the delivery point and a bit further away. So you see that there is this uh, spiking activity, which is the equivalent of a seizure, um, recorded with this electrode and recorded with that. And when we turn the pump on, then we can deliver drug here and stop the hyperactivity there. However, here, the activity still continues. This means that we're acting on the brain locally rather than flushing the systems with drugs. And this is important because localized drug delivery is a target we're after. You can take advantage of the fact that a material like P.PSS can be used to deliver the drug, but at the same time can be used as an electrode to sense brain activity. And this is what we've done here. With the same electrode, we can deliver a drug and measure activity. So you can make closed-loop systems where you can measure uh, brain activity, and when you see a seizure coming, then you turn the pump on and the seizure goes away. These were all in vitro. As of uh, a few months ago, we demonstrated the first in vivo system in an implantable uh, format that can be uh, placed close to the focus of a seizure. And we were able to show that we can induce a seizure in a rat, when the pump is off, but when we turn the pump on, the same uh, uh, attempt to, Im to, uh, uh, to cause a seizure fails, the brain does not seize. So we can prevent a seizure from occurring. This is in an animal model. We hope to be uh, in, uh, in the clinic uh, within three years. So with that, Implantable organic electronics hold considerable promise for understanding the brain and for addressing different pathologies. Organic electronic electrodes can capture um, signals from the brain with unprecedented uh, uh, spatial resolution. This is something that is on the way to the clinic. And electrophoretic ion pumps can deliver the drug without the solvent with excellent spatiotemporal resolution and they were shown to stop seizures in an animal uh, model. So with these technologies, and many more that I didn't have the time to talk about, we believe that in a couple of years, we'll be able to measure from the cortex in a non-invasive fashion, 
tens of thousands of neurons at the same time, which would be a major step in understanding how uh, the, the, the cortex part of the brain works. We'd be able to interfere with local circuits uh, in the brain with a resolution of a few neurons doing localized uh, drug delivery. And we're also developing sensors that can correlate metabolic activity with electrophysiology, again, at a very localized level. So these are amazing capabilities that will revolutionize the way we study and understand the brain, and hopefully will yield some new ways to treat brain disorders. With that, I would like to thank my group, our collaborators, former uh, uh, group members and uh, external collaborators, funding bodies, and you for your attention.